Hello amateurs, welcome back to another episode of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Sunday morning hangover with some wonderful rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host Tim and I've got another fantastic guest for you today. I have played with and against this man, he has played rugby all over the world and even won international caps for Singapore. Please welcome Mr Nick Dance. Dancer, how are you? Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a great intro. <laughs> if only everyone would give me an intro like that. <laughs> well, listen, you're very welcome on the show once again, because uh, regular listeners will know that Dancer appeared a good few years ago now. So um, if you want to go back and listen to that one, it talks all about Nick's life in rugby, travel stories, wonderful things. Uh, I'll link that one down below. But for those people that haven't seen that one, Dancer, just give me a quick overview of your rugby life, places you've played, that kind of thing. Rugby life, right. Well, uh, started at Bracknell um, and all the way up to university, then joined Cheltenham where I played with you and played basically for every club in Cheltenham, I think, um, apart from Smith's, Cheltenham North, Cheltenham Saracens, Old Pats. Uh, then um, I was up at Cambridge, played two and a half seasons up at Cambridge, played at Harlow before going back to Cheltenham. Um, and then off around the world I went, played in Fiji, played for New York in the US, um, and then played all over Asia, really. Singapore, um, based in Singapore, but I played at, in all the tennis tournaments, Phuket, Bali, um, Manila, Hong Kong, um, played in Australia, played New Zealand, Myanmar, Vietnam, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, Korea, Taiwan, I think that's about it, maybe. Played against Is Kazakhstan. That all? Yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, listen. Well, yeah, quite an extensive one in my playing time. Um, yeah, and then um, moved back to the UK uh, 2019 and uh, been based up in Cambridge ever since, really. Retired. <laughs> Retired from playing, at least. Retired from playing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Listeners, as I said, I'll, that... Is, goes into great detail in the other episode that we did. So I'll link that one down below. Give it, go and give it a listen. There's some fantastic stories in there. But now, like you said, Dancer, you're back at Cambridge, a club that's very close to your heart. And they have uh, recently spent their first season in the championship. So what are the reflections on being in the championship and all that that entails? Uh, it's tough. The championship's tough. I mean, we, we, we got, got up through National 1 and that was tough as well. We lost to Rams twice. Um, in the season, and we managed to pit them on the post in the last game of the season. So I went up, all very jubilant, all very happy and excited about the challenge ahead. And the challenge came with a big bump, you know, um, a lot bigger, bigger players, quicker, fitter. Um, and we've, we've, you know, we found it tough. We've had, we've won two games. We beat London Scottish at Scottish, and we beat Caldy at home. Um, apart from that, we've been close a couple of times. Um, but we're now sitting at the bottom um, and we'll probably be bottom of the league this season, but we're using it as a season to get used to it um, and to try and, you know, consolidate and plan ahead for next season. Because, of course, we are staying up due to the unfortunate demise of Jersey um, um, and Chinna are joining us from National One. Um, but it's been tough. I mean, with it's we've got new players in and it's all a learning curve for everybody um but hopefully we can um turn that switch for next season i know that works richie williams the dor is working really hard to get a decent uh to build on his current squad sorry and to get some some more decent players in and hopefully we can challenge a bit bit closer and a bit better um you know playing the likes of coventry bedford ealing nottingham um you know, Cornish Pirates, they're all quality sides. Um, we've, I think we found it difficult with the difference between professionalism and semi-professional, uh, where, you know, you look at the Doncaster Knights and they're training in a nice sunny afternoon and our boys train on a Tuesday night in the mud and rain. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's just totally different. There's also other factors such as playing on a Friday night and you're playing, for example, Coventry on a Friday night. All our guys work in London. So they've got to finish work, get to Coventry, play a game of rugby. Um, you know, what are the Coventry boys doing? Oh, I'll have the afternoon off and uh, get prepped for the game, which is, you know, and that's how it is. So, um, yeah, it's a steep learning curve. It's something I think we're excited by the challenge for next season. 
Um, next season, there is relegation, so all to play for. And hopefully there'll be some form of promotion for those guys at the top, um, you know. Uh, but yeah, it's a tough league. It's great rugby, though. Great rugby to watch. Um, you know, go along and watch a championship game. It's so quick in comparison to, to, to the leagues below. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just continue to fight ahead and see if we can uh, sustain that position for the forthcoming few seasons, really. Yeah, I mean, well, congratulations on the promotion, uh, first and foremost. And yeah, it's such a different world up in yeah. the championship compared to national one. One one division, but a whole world of differences, as you've just ably totally. described. Then. But totally. we're not really here to discuss the championship. We're here to discuss something that you've been working on uh, personally, behind the scenes almost, uh, to help to support, support the club and support rugby in and around the Cambridge area. So... Talk to me about this foundation, Dancer, what you've yeah. gone through with it so, what it's aimed Okay, so Cambridge Sports Development Foundation. We are uh, basically the community arm of Cambridge Rugby. Um, we sit alongside the rugby club, so I'm not actually employed by Cambridge Rugby. I oversee, manage and run and employed by the foundation, which has trustees um, who are involved in Cambridge Rugby. Um, the great thing about that is it takes me away from... The board scenario, I don't have to get seven people to agree something and have a two-month conversation about about paying for a table tennis table. You know, I can just go and get it done or speak to the trustees. Um, what we do, the, the main crux of what we do is we do alternate provision where we assist disadvantaged kids who may be excluded from school or maybe not get on at school or maybe not attending school, um, find lessons difficult. Uh, don't get on at the school, don't get on in their home environment. Um, we we invite them to come down through through um, working with the council. We invite them to come down to the club and they do one-on-one -on -one mentorship with our coaches. Uh, those coaches range from personal trainers to uh, we've got some young up-and-coming rugby players in the club looking for employment and we're developing them into coaches. Um, and we also employ some of our um, professional or semi-professional, I should say, rugby players as well. Um, that that alternate provision assists us to run the foundation without having to apply for grants, without having to apply for sponsorship. If you have grants, you're restricted by what you can spend it on. So, you know, if you get a grant to, uh, I don't know, if you get a grant to do year seven girls coaching rugby in a school for a term you have to spend that money on coaching year seven girls for a term in that school um we you know it's restricted funding the, the finance the, the the funds that we create from the alternative provision allow us to run the foundation and assist putting coaches when we deem necessary or when we can into schools to do those year sevens we're not restricted um you know, from that, we branch out where we work with primary schools. So we send coaches into primary schools um, and secondary schools. Uh, we're looking at now building an academy um, where we would hopefully have coaches go into sixth form colleges um, to, to develop and deliver rugby. When we can then hopefully get those guys who are already playing rugby attracted to come to us because we've got something that's really worth uh, looking at and being involved with and building some form of academy. Um, on top of that, we, you know, we, we, over, we, we help and assist with the new women's program at Cambridge Rugby. Um, so there's lots of stuff, lots of stuff that the foundation oversees, but the general crux of it is, is running alongside the club in order to, in order to run the community aspect without affecting what goes on at the rugby club, apart from attracting members. Um, and in fact, because of the finance, we actually can pay rent to the rugby club. So the rugby club can receive some funds. So as well as not employing a community department themselves, it's being run by someone else and they're receiving income for rental for use of the facilities, which on, on the, in the everyday scheme of things is never used. It's just an empty shell as rugby clubs are. They just, in, you know, on a Tuesday afternoon, there's not generally anything going on at rugby club unless you've got an event booked. Um, so, you know, that is generally the foundation and it's something that really enthuses me because I want to be able to give back to rugby. I want to be able to 
offer rugby to those people who may not be able to have access to it through, for whatever reason be, 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 it, be it, you know, their friends don't play or they haven't got the finance to join a rugby club. Um, I'm keen to be able to offer rugby for all. Um, so that that's basically how the foundation works. And it's, it's, some, it's something that's very exciting, I think, and something that I think with uh, work could develop further and assist other clubs as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the biggest thing there for me that I'm taking away is is those final sentences, growing rugby and for as many people as possible. So that's what I'm really passionate about. But I know this hasn't come easily. I know there's been challenges along the way. So just talk to me a little bit about some of the, the challenges or some of the things you've had to, lessons you've learned maybe. Yeah, the, the biggest thing was I sort of, when I took on the role and it started around October 21, I sort of found myself trying to work out how to do it. I had no guidance. I had no one to help me, no one to sort of hold my hand. It was sort of me sticking my finger in the air and go, let's try this. Um, you know, and from that, you obviously get good things, but you also get bad things, you know, negative points. And, you know, there are struggles there. It's making sure that, you know, you've got, I mean, there's a, if you're doing something like this, there's a ton of policies to write. I knew nothing about policies when I started and no guidance, you know, and uh, now I, I'm the key policy writer. I think I've done 30 so far and they have to be updated every year, um, you know, and they're, they, we are quality assured by the local council, by the local authority, the county council, you know, and without that quality assurance, schools won't come to approach us in order to take these students on. So, you know, it's getting, it's building relationships, which has taken three or four years. It's not just an, you know, but from that, we've got positive relationships in the local schools who know know the name of the foundation, know my name, and, you know, we have candid conversations. So it, it the, the hardest thing was overcoming that and knowing that you're doing something right or learning to do something on the whim, you know, and you learn from your mistakes which, uh, you know, you've got all your safety. I mean, safeguarding is massive. And when I came back from Singapore, there was, when I went, when I left Singapore, there was nothing, no safeguarding. Now, everything, it's clinical. You've got to have everyone, obviously, DBS approved. You've got to go through your various safeguarding courses. You've got your health and safety and the safeguarding policies. You've got to make sure that you've got less of assurance ready to go for your team. You know, all that type of red tape, which which takes time to build, or build the knowledge on, and then you've got to have it on file, ready to go. Um, so, I mean, yeah, the hardships are, as, as everything you do, when you do your first one, you learn and you build and you build and you build. But now after two or three years, I've sort of got it where we've got a system where it's it's just, yeah, I'll send them that. And, and suddenly everyone's going, wow, that's very prompt because you're, you know, because they're not used to that. And that's through me knowing or me learning that I've done it the wrong way and I haven't done that, if you see what I mean. <laughs> so yeah, they're the main absolutely. I mean, funding is always a challenge, but we've we've found a resource that hopefully can continue to build. It can help kids, but it can also then allow us to spread 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 up spread us in other ways that can assist the foundation, the rugby club and rugby in general. Yeah. Okay. So give me an idea of the scale we're at at the moment, Dan. So, you know, so how, think, many kids, um, how many yeah, schools? We started, with, started with myself doing it. I had one member of staff took on in beginning of 23 season. Um, I'm now up to seven members of staff. Um, we started with two kids coming once a week. I've got 25 kids coming per week, some coming five times a five times a week, you know, for two, uh, for two hour slots. Um, we have a wait list of eight kids ready to go. I mean, from my perspective, the more staff I can get, the more kids we can help. That That's how I, how I envisage it. Um, you know, we've got to be aware that these kids are not in school for a reason, you know? So we have, we've been, we're mindful of, of making sure there's enough space for, you know, some play together, some do sport together, some don't want to be together. We've got to make sure we've got enough space and facilities to accommodate all, all the all the all the various people that we get in. Um, but it really it, it's such a rewarding thing to be able to do. Um, 
you know, a, a prime example is we had uh, one 15 year old come in just before GCSEs, probably about, he probably came in six months before GCSEs, um, accused of knife crime in the city. Um, we would have to security search wand, you know, we would, uh, with a metal detector and he would come in with his four pairs of tracksuit bottoms around him and his mask on, his hoodie up, not wanting to talk to anyone. By the time he left us, he uh, was playing chess. Um, he wasn't going to, he was, he was, he, he helped make the table, you know, set up the table, tennis table. Um, and on top of that, he passed four GCSEs. And I'm not saying that's just down to us because there's other, other, you know, other areas that, that, that he benefited from, but he wasn't going to go to his GCSEs. And in fact, I was the one who put him in a taxi and said, just go try it, see how you get on. And that was an art one. He passed it. And we're still in, I'm still in touch with his parents now, just making sure that he knows that we're there if we need him. Um, you know, and and there are so many kids like that out there that just need a bit of attention, a bit of TLC, a bit of a challenge, but they don't do it. At, they don't get it at school. They want to do it. They love sport. So we do it through sport. Um, we, we're not just rugby based for that, for that alternate revision. We do, you know, we're called Cambridge Sports Foundation for a reason. If you go to a rugby club, you get turned up. Some kids don't want to do rugby. Um, so we offer football, basketball, table tennis, snooker, volleyball, badminton. I'm trying to think what the other ones we've got. Dodgeball, spike ball, um, all that type of stuff. So, you know, a wide variety of stuff that keeps them entertained for a couple of hours and gives them the attention of a mentor slash coach one-on-one for them to be able to talk to, learn about pathways. We talk do nutrition. We offer them, you know, do you want to get stronger, faster? We set them challenges. Um, we try and try and build their morale, try and get them communicating to people like me who, you know, are very old. Um, <laughs> so I just think it's, it's, a, it's a massive thing within the, uh, within, with what we do at the rugby club um, under the foundation, which then allows, allows us the benefits of moving forth into the community to push out the rugby side of things as well. Yeah, that's amazing. And actually, you know, I'm obviously very much focused on the rugby, but what you've just described there is something much, much bigger in terms of helping these kids who have serious problems in their lives, which is amazing. But let's talk about the rugby. The what? what how many you know sessions are you doing in schools? That kind of thing. How many coaches are going out? Yeah. So currently we are, it's, it's obviously out of season, um, but we're working with primary schools. So we're in 11 primary schools now. Um, we've got about four or five coaches um, who, are, who are coaching going into their, into these schools. Just They're just doing tags. It's non-contact. It's out of season. Um, we are, in the season, we'll be looking at going to two, two lower sixth forms, talking to universities, going to probably we'll probably go into about 15 to 20 schools from September that's the plan depend and it depends on coach numbers now um a lot of that again is down to funding as well but then we've got that resource now that we're building on to have some some financial support as well and on top of that then we do look at we then look at the grants and the uh and, and bid bids to try and get funding to assist schools um you know be it I mean, there's two ways to look at it in the schools. You either, the school pays for it, the parents, sorry, three ways, the parents pay for it or a grant pays for it, you know, or, or you know, the, the coach is going for free and that's funded by the foundation. Um, that, 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 and that is the area that, that's the problem of getting sport into schools is funding, you know, it's great. It's great that people have these great ideas. Yeah, we can get these people to schools. We can offer this and offer that. But someone's got to pay for it. You know, um, unfortunately, all our coaches don't work for free. Or volunteers. It'd be lovely if they were, um, but they're not. You know, equipment costs as well. Um, so you know, that's 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 the big hiccup in the in the that's, that's the barrier in the room is is getting it funded. And if we can find a resource of funding that doesn't affect the school doesn't affect us being restricted, doesn't affect the parents who can't afford it, then surely we want to utilise that in order to build rugby in the community. 
Absolutely. And, and you've got that, right? So the big question is, like, what were your lessons uh, learned in terms of getting that kind of independent funding? Uh, well, the lessons, the independent funding is, the, the main crux of the funding is the alternative provision. Yeah, right. that's the main crux of the funding. Um, okay. You know, we don't, we, I would love to get a sponsor for the foundation. Yeah, um, we do have a few small sponsors. I love to get, you know, a big sponsor name to the so-and-so Cambridge Sports Development Foundation um, or a sponsor to be able to, you know, right, we want to help schools, right? There's, there's a chunk of cash. Go and spend that on the schools, you know, get your coaches into schools and make sure they're aware, uh, the awareness that that, that company is overseeing that program. Um, but I don't want to have to rely on that. I want to be able to have, you know, if, if we see a school that we can go in there and assist, we've got that funding now, the independent funding through the alternative provision to be able to offer that. That That's generally how we want it to work. Um, on top of that, it, it, you know, it creates more jobs in the area as well. We've got personal trainers now who have their clients in the morning and clients in the evening. So now they come along and they, and they assist these kids, um, you know, which is great. So, and, and then hopefully we can build from that and that, that helps, you know, all types of things really um, to, to, to generate an interest in the sport and to be able to say, if I, if you go to a school and say, listen, we will put coaching there and it doesn't cost you anything. You, that, that's the dream. Yeah. That's what yeah. schools want and that's what we want. But, you know, we have to be realistic, <laughs> you know, and that, and to make sure that they're accountable for it as well as us. Yeah. Because obviously yeah, it's take, sure. take, take and not give back. Yeah. So how do you try and uh, generate that accountability? Like what kind of things are you looking for from the schools? Um, I suppose it's, it's, it's making sure they're driving forward the program that wants to do drive, you know, encouraging, encouraging uh, signups, encouraging uh, their students to be involved, um, giving us opportunities at key times. We've done a number of school assemblies uh, where, I mean, where we present, where, where, the, where the players present, you know, their their rugby history and and what they enjoy doing. And they're always asked how much do you get paid? <laughs> you know, <laughs> ask any questions, how much do you get paid? Not very much, you know. Um, or, or, you know, what's your biggest injury? You all know what your biggest injury is as well. <laughs> how much, how much, how much, how much pain have you been in playing rugby is a normal question or something like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we just want them to support us by marketing or putting it out there to, to the kids or to the parents who obviously sign up their children to, to push, uh, to push their students to come and speak to us if they, they enjoy, they want to develop further, you know, and then we would then tie them up with the various suitable rugby club, depending on where their location, depending on where their friends are, or depends on where their school is based. Um, again, it's not just about Cambridge rugby. It's about developing rugby in the region to everybody, you know. So if they're based at Newmarket, we'll push them to Newmarket. If they're based at you know, or the Whiz Beach, they're up there. You know, we're not going to say, oh, we'll come down to Cambridge because we want all, you know, it, it's not about that. It's about making people enthused and enjoying join the game, really, and wanting to try the game out in whatever format. Yeah, amazing. Okay, so I think we've had a pretty good uh, overview here. But if other people are listening to this and going, I'd love to do that with my club, how do people get started, Dancer? What would be your sort of advice? Yeah, so as I said before, that one of the one of the big issues I had was how to start, as as you just said. You know, um, I'm putting myself out there as I'm 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 keen to try and help clubs that may want to start, may want to look at this and have a discussion to see how and if I can help them at all. You know, setting up, talking about ideas, talking about what we did, how we did it, and then potentially you know assisting them in in getting it set up in the in the area with with my my experiences and my my you know the positives and the negatives and making sure that you know i can sort of handhold or handhold them onto to making sure it's sustainable and that they can get into their community um that that's that's my dream my dream is to be able to help other clubs around the country to develop their community because they should be, you know, all the clubs should be attracting uh, kids from, from local schools. 
they should be helping out disadvantaged kids. You know, they should be help. They should be wanting to thrive in the community and be a part of the community. Having an empty clubhouse in the daytime is not needed. You, we can, we can, you know, we can look at other other ideas in order to try and make sure it, it survive. It's it's something that's utilised by your community in any way possible. Um, so I'm I'm keen to try and have discussions with clubs or anyone in the club who may be interested in learning more. Um, you know, away from this this portal and just to just to try and try and help develop that. And so if anyone's interested, and we'll put my details on later um, at the end or, or in the links, et cetera, if anyone's interested in having a conversation with me about how we did it and how I can help, um, be more than willing to, to, to offer that assistance. Yeah, amazing, mate. And of course, creating jobs as well, which is such, a, such an amazing part of this that it seems like it, it's a win-win-win for everybody involved. Yeah, there's no, I mean, there's no down part on it really. I mean, obviously you've got to have someone to, to run the program for you. And as I said, we, no one works for free, but you know, it, it's something we can, we can discuss and how that works. Um, you know, you might get a small sponsor just to cover them a bit until you get started. It, it's just, to, the idea I have is, is doing what I do all around the country, um, you know, assisting clubs and then working myself away from it in order for them to be ongoing and sustainable moving forward and then help them helping within the community. That's that's the dream I have. Now, how that works is obviously, you know, I'm, I'm literally learning on the job now um, through my experience and knowledge. And I'd be keen to talk to anyone interested. Um, you know, I've had a few conversations with some clubs. Anyone interested in in how they can how they can develop that further and push that forward? Uh, yeah, we we also employ some of our players. Um, obviously, moving up from National One to Championship comes with having to to sub to pay players on a semi professional rate. And you know, we these guys come in and they're looking for additional income. So they come on board and it helps them with uh, them building ties with the community as well as them building their CV with coaching, first aid certificates, which to be honest, they didn't have before, you know, getting a DBS and knowing how it, understanding how it all works, getting their coaching qualification. Um, you know, so it's all about helping others, be it from internally within our club to helping employment outside of the club to helping kids outside of the club who may not have experienced rugby before, um, who want to try different sports, which then helps going into the schools in order to generate rugby interest, which then sees it comes back to the club, hopefully in your mini and youth section. Um, and the more interest you get, the more opportunities you get. And hopefully someday and we'll have a nice big company with a big fat wallet, want to say, we want to support that program, um, you know, and it's an onwards and upwards. So that's, that's sort of the crux of it. And we're just at the beginning stage. So there's no reason why other clubs can't do it as well. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, we will finish that part of the show there, Dancer. <laughs> Great stuff. And we'll move on to the stash section because I don't think we did this on the last episode that no. we did. So what is your favourite bit of stash you've ever received? So I've actually got some stash here. <laughs> From my touring days. I mean, a lot of my a lot of my clothes I've actually made into a chair. I got made, uh, you know, an upholstered chair, which is actually at the rugby club at the moment. Um, but I've got... Um, so I've, I've teamed up with a, a sort of company or a social team called the Pack Barbars, which is short for Pig Athletic Club Barbarians. Uh, they literally, they, they played in the Hong Kong Tens about three weeks ago and they lost in the final to Shogun, which used to be Samurai. Okay. Um, so I've teamed up with them. And in fact, they used to do something called Pack Kit. Uh, I've got a couple of their... They love their uh, their different pastel colours, which I think like um, so. It's more like the Miami. The what was the the, the Miami it began with a G? Uh, one of the Miami teams, anyway. So you've got pastels. Oh wow! Look at that. That is a green and pink. So that's uh, beautiful. Yeah, and then you got. Um, so I, I quite like the the, the big bold colours. Where we've got uh, various tour shirts, but one of my favourite is we've got a Louis Vuitton design, which we played in the Bangkok Tens. <laughs> I could go on for hours, my kit. We played the Louis yeah. Vuitton design, which we, we actually won the Bangkok Tens um, with a Louis Vuitton design. Oh wow, that is Larry. 
<laughs> so um yeah i mean it, favorite kit is is running out in 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 different colors in intense tournaments and just socials and just enjoying that um with the branding probably my favorite brand is uh tsunami which is a, um, a company based out in hong kong um and they do they're green sustainable so a lot of their shirts are made through through uh, recycling and stuff like that um the other, the one I like in the UK, which we've we've had at Dubai a couple of times, is Knowledge and Teamwear Kit. Um, they're based out in Ireland, but they sell a lot in Wales, um, so they're quite a cool kit brand as well. Nice. Okay, next question: What is your favourite kit of all time? So this can be any team from any era. What do I put down there? I yeah, that's it. <laughs> My favorite kit that what that I've played in or in no and any team any team. See, we did have a kit in uh, we did have a kit in Manila Tens, which was knowledge and teamwork kit, which was a nice white and silver logos on it. Um, that was quite cool. Um, I'm just trying to think of a well known team that people know <laughs> rather uh, <laughs> rather than just just talking about my exploits and what clothes I wore. <laughs> <laughs> go with it mate if white and silver that sounds amazing silver, yeah silver. i mean it's the same design as the same design as this one which is the knowledge and teamwear top which we all wore in uh in manila so yeah, it was white, we had blue and uh, it was a white and we had the silver with a sort of big face mask on the front um but that was quite a cool right. kit to wear over there it stood out massively yeah for sure okay what about awful kits dancer any that you really dislike Remember that Stade Francaise shirt? Which one? <laughs> oh, the, yeah, the one with the little faces all over it. Do you remember that one? Yeah. That must be quite popular. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people say that one, don't they? Uh, that's yeah. quite a popular Yeah, it's one. a few. Yeah. And anything that looks like you've just vomited all over it. <laughs> I mean, what, what is a nice, a nice, really good designer um, and is a samurai slash shogun kit? You know, it's sort of got half that samurai face on the side and you'll see it when in, around the seven series i quite like their kits and they're now manufactured by umbro um but they're quite some i do cool designs yeah really cool yeah. yeah i'm a big fan as well okay um before we finish up mate i know you want to give a shout out to your your dad um so yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> that's all right um for, I, I, my dad um was named john dance he was uh, president of rugby union in 2014 um, however, I think it was quite apt asking for a shout out for him on this podcast because he was a massive grassroots champion. I think you'll probably find that most current, most most committees, well, most local rugby clubs would know the name John Dance in some respect. Some may not like the name <laughs> or, you know, um, but unfortunately he passed away in uh, in January. So I just really wanted to sort of send a dedication out. He, he worked tirelessly for grassroots clubs, um, making sure that, you know, they were looked after by the rugby union. He was, uh, as I say, he was president of the rugby union. He was also represented the rugby union on world rugby um, for two years. And he was on the council, RFU council for about 20 years. And in fact, if my memory serves me correctly, when the old, when the comment 57 old farts came out in the newspaper by Will Carling, um, he was a 57 old fart, but he was about 50, which is younger than me now. And he actually agreed with Will Carling, from what I remember. I may not be right, but um, that's what he told me anyway. But yeah, unfortunately, he passed away. So just wanted to uh, to put a shout out for him because what he did for rugby clubs, uh, you know, as a volunteer as well, was massive. Um, so hopefully some of the guys listening to this remember him. Yeah, 100%. Condolences, mate, of course. And yeah, great men in rugby or great people in rugby, I should say. Um, uh, yeah, they need all the celebrating that we can get because it all seems to land on the shoulders of too few uh, yeah. so often, yeah, all the work. So yeah. thank you for doing that, mate. And thanks to your dad for all the work he did, particularly for grassroots clubs, as far as I'm concerned. Now, uh, we will link everything that we've mentioned in the show notes below Dancer, one last final shout out for this foundation idea and how it can help any rugby club around the world. <laughs> around the world. Wow. Now we're really going somewhere. Um, so it's the Cambridge <laughs> Sports Development Foundation. Um, 
the website is linked to Cambridge Rugby. Um, so just go to the Cambridge, Google Cambridge Rugby, we're on there, but we'll put the link down. It's, it's really, as I said, just about helping people. Um, it helps kids, it helps players, it helps the local community, it helps our rugby club, it helps rugby. Um, and and for, there's no reason why other grassroots clubs or, or clubs in the country can't develop the same system. And I'm happy to talk to anyone about that. Yeah, and if people want to get in hold uh, in touch with you, dancers specifically, what's the best way for them to do that? So email, um, as I said, the link will be there, community at crufc.co.uk. Um, just give us drop us a line there. Um, my 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 contact details are on the Cambridge Rugby website. Um, just look up the contact there. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, etc. Just 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 get hold of me somehow. You know, there's. I'm not hiding anything. I'm here to help. So, uh, yeah, the links are everywhere, hopefully. Yeah, okay, perfect. As I said, I will link all of that stuff down below. So it just leaves me to say, Dancer, thanks so very much for your time today and all the work you're doing. Thanks. And if anyone's going to the Bournemouth Sevens, I'll see you there on the pitch. I ain't playing, though. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing stuff. Okay, thank you, mate. Yeah, what Dancer's talking about there, he's going to be refereeing. So uh, make sure you're on your best behaviour and say hello to Nick from me as well, if you're there. Also, thanks again, Dancer, for all this work because it's helping rugby, it's helping rugby people, it's helping grow the game. But as I've learned today, it's even broader than that. It's really kind of helping society as well. So this is a big thing and it could be something your rugby club can do, wants to do, might look at doing. Go and have a chat with Dancer and see what you can learn from there. Now, if you've enjoyed this podcast, you can do all the social media stuff like comment, subscribe, share, all that jazz. Definitely get on to YouTube so that you can go and see all those beautiful shirts that dancers just held up to the screen. But what I'd really like is if you mention it to someone in person the next time you're down your local rugby club. But until then, get out and play. <laughs>